Good morning and welcome to the Downtown Aviation and Redevelopment Subcommittee for June 3rd. My name is Daniel Valenzuela, Phoenix Vice Mayor. I'm honored to be chairing this subcommittee. I'm joined by my colleagues, Councilwoman uh, Kate Gallego from District 8, Councilwoman Thelda Williams from District 1, and soon to be joining us by phone will be uh, District 3 Councilman Bill Gates. Councilman Gates? Yes. Wel welcome. Thank you. Uh, so we we obviously have a quorum. All four members are uh, in will be participating in this subcommittee. We're calling the meeting to order now. The uh, item two is the call to the public. Just a reminder: we begin and end each meeting with the call to the public. Uh, people are also able to fill out a card to speak on any given item. It's just rem a reminder that we are here for our constituents. So there is no. There are no cards for item two. There will be cards for other items. Uh, item three, approval of the May 20th, 2015 minutes. Move approval. Second. A motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Motion. Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Item four is for consent. Uh, move uh, approval. Second. We have a motion and a second for item four. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Item five is for information and discussion on the FAA changes in aircraft departure uh, procedures and update. This has been a standing item for the past few months, uh, and and we have some new. We always have news. You always do a good job of, of bringing an update uh, for our, our neighborhood leaders, community leaders, the people of Phoenix. Uh, but there's been some big, new, big news uh, this week. Right. Um, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, Vice Mayor Valenzuela and subcommittee members. Uh, it's just only been two weeks since we were before this subcommittee, um, since the May meeting fell a little bit later in the month. Um, so there's not a, a whole lot of new information to report other than the big news that um, we did file uh, suit on Monday. Unfortunately, um, after working trying very hard to, to work through um, and find a solution. Uh, we were unable to achieve that, and so the city did file suit on Monday. Uh, we do have a few other things um, to update the subcommittee on, so uh, with that, I will turn it over to Assistant Aviation Director Chad Makovsky. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, Vice Mayor, members of the subcommittee, uh, just a quick update uh, in terms of complaints to date. As of May 29th, uh, the last time we updated our records, uh, 10,812 complaints coming from 1,257 households throughout the valley uh, compared again to calendar year 2013 where we received 221 noise complaints uh, in the entire year. Uh, some, some relatively big news and events that have occurred in the last couple of weeks that uh, we think are important to update you and the community on. Uh, back to May 19th, uh, as we continue to move forward with the six-point plan that uh, the council has approved and adopted, uh, we uh, and the mayor, uh, a number of our council members, including Councilwoman uh, Gallego, Councilwoman Pastor, Councilman Nowakowski, uh, and former Congressman Pastor met with uh, Deputy Administrator Michael Whitaker with the FAA uh, and uh, senior executives with Southwest Airlines, as well as representatives with American Airlines and Airlines for America, which is the trade association representing uh, the airline industry. Uh, at that meeting, we made a request uh, to uh, reconvene again a working group that would uh, work without constraints and would look for real solutions to the issues at hand that, that have been so uh, severely impacting the communities close to the airport. Uh, at that meeting, the deputy administrator announced uh, one new revelation that we thought was helpful in, in really coming back together, and that was that he acknowledged that the FAA would be willing to consider a new federal action, which was a constraint that we, unbeknownst to us, was placed on the previous PBN working group that we uh, uh, were working through as we were looking for solutions. So that was new information. It, it opened up the door for us to get a little bit more serious about options and solutions. Uh, and so we accepted uh, that uh, agreement to come back together. And in the following week, on May 27th through 28th, uh, we assembled a technical team with the City of Phoenix, um, the FAA, uh, the FAA had about 15, 16 representatives uh, at that meeting, uh, as well as representatives from our two largest carriers, Southwest Airlines and American Airlines. At that meeting, uh, we talked about a number of things. We talked about 
um, short-term solutions, uh, things that we might be able to do within the next six months to provide some immediate relief to the community. Examples of some of the uh, short-term solutions that were proposed and discussed include making sure there is more strict conformance with the early turn initiative uh, than there is today. The FAA certainly agreed to, to look at that. Uh, we also uh, talked about providing relief at night uh, for the most impacted residents by uh, moving those planes on a more compatible corridor, perhaps along the river bottom. Uh, we think that's a reasonable solution because we think um, at, at that time of night the traffic loads at Sky Harbor are such that uh, it could be done without interfering with capacity and the efficiencies that the FAA and the airlines are, are focused on. And so the FAA and the airlines acknowledge that they would be willing to look at that further. They, they would not at that time really want to be uh, focused on a specific time frame until we had more data, more information, but they did agree that that would be something worth pursuing. And we also talked about a couple of other uh, issues. Uh, examples would include um, uh, noise abatement overlays, talking about the airlines using uh, industry accepted noise abatement procedures when they're operating their aircraft and, and things of that nature. In terms of long-term uh, solutions, we don't think that that's what the short-term solutions would be enough to, um, to, to move forward uh, with. Uh, in the long term, and so we said we need to come up with a more meaningful relief over the long term, recognizing it could take longer with a new federal action. It could take uh, anywhere from a year and a half to two years, depending on the environmental review associated with the, environment, the, the new federal action. We proposed a series of routes, uh, both to the northwest and to the southwest, where we think aircraft can get up to a meaningful altitude of 6,000 feet or above, where they get outside of that 75 SEL contour that we've talked about. Uh, and. Um, and so we were really focused on what can we do there to get them on a compatible, more compatible corridor, get to an altitude where they, um, when they do turn over populated areas, they won't be as impactful as they are today. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, the FAA said they would consider our alternatives. They appreciated the fact that we offered new alternatives to them. Uh, they, they thought about it over the weekend. Unfortunately, on Monday, June 1st, they called us back and, and said while they appreciated the, the efforts of the city, uh, they just couldn't quite get where we needed them to get uh, as far as getting out on those compatible corridors. They did offer some solutions, uh, though, that they were willing to consider, and it is in a letter that's been posted to the City of Phoenix website. They, they offered uh, a solution on Grand Avenue Corridor where they could move the, the flight path slightly further to the west. They'd suggested no more than one-third of a mile, which is about 1,700 feet. We didn't think that was enough to really address the issues that uh, are at play. On the southwest corridor, they talked about following river bottom heading for a longer period of time, perhaps another couple miles, uh, before they tr make that turn to the south. However, when they make that turn to the south, they, we believe, based on our analysis, they would still significantly impact the, uh, the South Phoenix and Levine communities. And largely, that first waypoint would, we would expect would, uh, would remain unchanged. And so I th we think that the communities that are impacted today would still be uh, impacted going forward. So we came to a position where we um, just couldn't get there. And, and uh, it was, the decision was made at the, with consultation with the mayor, council, uh, our city manager's office to go ahead and move forward uh, with litigation. Uh, on Monday, late in the afternoon, we did file a petition for judicial review with the Federal Court of Appeals, the D.C. Circuit. Um, unfortunately, this is a lengthy process, and it's why we really wanted to exhaust administrative remedies, working with the FAA in collaboration to try to come up with a resolution before we went here. But we are at that place where we think it's appropriate to take that next step. Uh, this process uh, is an administrative review by uh, the Federal Court of Appeals. And what it means at this point is we've filed the petition. We will serve the FAA with that petition. In fact, it probably has already been done by our, our legal counsel. Um, the FAA will then have an opportunity to file its record. And at that time, they may actually file for a motion to dismiss. Uh, we would expect that they might try to do that initially. Um, we, the Department, and to, be, to clarify, the Department of Justice is who will be handling this case on behalf of the Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, so they may file for a motion to dismiss, uh, but ultimately, if the court uh, rejects that, which we expect that they will, um, uh, we, we hope that they will want to hear our case. The FAA would file its record. Once the FAA files its record, the city will file a, uh, a petitioner's brief, which will be a more lengthy uh, document to identify exactly why we think the, um, the FAA is flawed in its logic with the environmental process. Uh, much of what that will contain, we expect, will be along the lines of our legal protest, which really set the record for us. And that information is available at skyharbor.com slash flight paths. There will be a little bit more of this back and forth where the file FAA has the opportunity to respond to our brief, and then we have an opportunity to respond to the FAA's response uh, to set the record. 
At that point, the uh, Court of Appeals would, would likely um, offer an opportunity to provide oral argument on both sides before they uh, review everything that's been provided to them and, and come to a decision. Based on uh, past uh, our, uh, the, our, our legal um, counsel's understanding and experience with this type of process, they, they said we should expect it will take 18 to 24 months in total before we would get some sort of court decision. So just another uh, quick, quick couple of updates uh, from our noise office. Um, we have now, as of uh, March of this year, so March, April, and the May monthly report, have included uh, early churn information in that report. We know that's something that's still of interest to our, uh, some members of our community. So we are providing that information, and we are working with the FA in a collaborative way to understand the reasons for those early churns. So we can, you know, some of them may be safety related, some may be deconflicting with other traffic, for example. Uh, the FA pointed out at one point in time we had to move a plane early because there was uh, police helicopter activity right along the flight path, and so they needed to deconflict that. So there are reasons, legitimate reasons, for them uh, doing these er early turns. That said, uh, it's important that we, we uh, ask the questions and make sure that they, they provide us with information there. Uh, the second point is the plane noise solution. We've heard from a number of our community members that our noise uh, complaint or concern uh, web uh, submittal form has uh, periodically gone down or gone out of service. Uh, that is a city-hosted solution. Um, and so what we think is, is right now, because of the need to maintain a higher availability and because of the interest of the community to have that service available to them, that we move it to a third-party uh, hosting uh, source. Plain Noise is a highly regarded solution in the industry. It, they use that at JFK airports. They use it at Boston Airport. They use it at a number of high-profile airports. And what it will do is it will log all that information. The city of Phoenix will still get every bit of that information. It immediately comes to us. And people who want a call back from the city will continue to have that uh, opportunity to do so. So there's nothing should really change significantly for the community other than having a higher uh, availability, more robust solution than they have today. And then the last piece is uh, effective July 1, we will be authorized to uh, bring in three new, uh, new uh, noise uh, staff, a program manager, and two planners to help us continue uh, to provide services to the community and handle this uh, additional workload. We get, uh, over the weeks, uh, a lot of information uh, and questions from the community about why is the plane flying west today, flying east tomorrow. What, it's, it's hard for community members, uh, some community members, to understand kind of how that works. First and foremost, uh, planes do fly in the, the direction that the wind is coming from. Uh, and then there is also this thing called equalization. And, and there is an intergovernmental uh, agreement between the city of Phoenix and the city of uh, Tempe that talks about the need to equalize traffic to the east and the west. In some cases, as you can see over the, the graph here, over the last um, year, the last 12 months, prevailing winds are coming from the east. And at other times throughout the year, they're coming from the west. You can see in January 2015, for example, 83.5% of the air traffic actually went to the east and very little of it went to the west. We are now getting to that time of year, April, going into May, um, where we ex would expect to see a higher percentage of traffic going to the west. During calm winds, though, the FAA does make a concerted uh, effort to, to move traffic in the direction uh, that is needed to maintain that 50-50 balance. And so that's, that's the focus there. And then the last piece uh, for me is the aircraft noise listserv. Uh, we have over 100 people who have signed up for this. We encourage community members to, to sign up for this. This is available at skyharbor.com slash flight paths. What we've discovered is when we do major blasts of information across the valley, many people are interested in noise information, but there are just as many people who aren't. And, and so this is a way for us to really provide targeted information to the community members who most desire to get it. And uh, this, this website, uh, if they log in and, and subscribe to this listserv, it guarantees that they will get those timely updates. With that, I'll turn it back over to Tammy to talk a little bit more about next steps. Thank you, Chad. Going forward, um, even though we have taken, um, unfortunately, the step of moving forward with litigation, we will continue to focus on our six-point plan and uh, work on strategies to engage and empower a community to work with us uh, through these issues. We will continue to uh, talk to the airlines about temporary or voluntary measures that we might be able to achieve um, and work with our uh, Washington, D.C. representative to help us uh, build a coalition of other cities together as well as airport industry members um, and work on language for reauthorization. Hopefully we can change the language um, that would prevent this from happening again uh, where the FAA uh, has the ability to make pretty significant changes without any public consultation. That's something we're very interested 
in uh, changing in the next reauthorization bill. Uh, the Metroplex process, we have submitted comments on that. Uh, we'll continue to keep track of that environmental assessment process as it moves forward and stay engaged in that. And then, um, as Chad mentioned, uh, we are actively pursuing ways to enhance our noise uh, office at Sky Harbor, our noise program, uh, to provide the best possible service to the community and responding to their questions and concerns about noise impacts in the community. We will be adding additional staff uh, to build the airspace expertise within the planning division at Sky Harbor, as well as um, additional staff to be able to uh, provide uh, good responsiveness uh, to the community when they call for information and to report concerns. And that's that concludes our update for uh, the subcommittee, Vice Mayor. Thank you so much. I do have a, I do have a card. Is that okay to go to Ginger Maddox? We give uh, all of our speakers two minutes. Subcommittee Welcome. members, um, as you know, I've been involved in this issue from day one, and I want to compliment the city on the actions that they've taken. I was initially very opposed to filing a lawsuit until we had exercised all of our options. I believe we've come to that point. So I compliment you on, on this moving forward with this. One thing I would like to suggest now that we are in a new phase is that the community needs to have some faith that there is going to be transparency and possible solutions. So I've made the suggestion to the aviation department that I believe it's time for a status update on the employee review that was uh, take undertaken several, I believe, months ago. Whether it is completed, it's not completed, what the status is, I believe I understand the situation, but that doesn't mean that I'm correct, and that doesn't mean that the public understands it. So I think in the sake of transparency, it's time to do a status report on that. Thank you. Thank you. I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Mm -hmm. Councilman. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that update. I am glad we are pursuing multiple different courses, I think that is likely to lead to higher success. And this afternoon, we'll be taking more action on focusing on a legislative path to try to really make sure that we are able to build coalitions. Um, certainly, the last time I was meeting with the White House about this issue, they did mention they hear from many other communities. And they are surprised we are not working more together. So hopefully, Phoenix can be a leader in really putting together some of those stories from all across the country, because many of my colleagues in other cities have similar stories to tell. And hopefully, we can really educate the FAA about how much we know about those of us who are on the ground and make sure that their voices are amplified as we go forward in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Gates, do you have anything? I don't, Mr. Chairman. OK. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, for the update. I do want to I want to thank our neighborhood leaders, first and foremost. Uh, you've You've been a partner. You've been you pushed all of us. We're not there yet. I still believe we're closer to the beginning than we are the end. But uh, we're certainly all working together. This is the first time I believe a major city has taken a step like this, and and we're doing it together. And uh, you know that's that's all we can say at this point. So a lot more work ahead of us, but we're not allergic to that. So it's good. Thank you. All right, it's, uh, items six and seven, discussion and action. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the subcommittee, um, item number six is regarding ground transportation uh, at the airport. Uh, while uh, planes taking off and landing is a role of the airport, fundamentally getting people from the airport to where they go next is, is no smaller of an issue for the community. And uh, valet parking has been a topic of some interest for a number of years, and Tammy and her team are here today to tell you about um, their proposals for advancing that concept. Thank you, Paul. As Paul mentioned, we are not only in dealing with, we, we deal with planes, trains, and automobiles at Sky Harbor, all forms of transportation. And we're always looking at ways to respond to our customers and adding product offerings at Sky Harbor that meet the needs and the changing uh, 
desires of our airport passengers. So we are here today to uh, make a recommendation on a new uh, ballet parking service at Sky Harbor, a pilot program. Here with me uh, today is Irene Larkin, uh, Acting Assistant Aviation Director for Business and Properties, Finance and Technology, and Roxanne Favors, Deputy Aviation Director of Business and Properties. Good morning, Vice Mayor, members of the subcommittee. We're excited to be here today to present for your consideration um, some business terms for bringing valet services to Sky Harbor. We're continuously working towards providing a world-class customer service experience to our passengers, and in doing so, we look at the industry and benchmark the industry and our peer airports to make sure that we are in line with what they are doing. And in some of our benchmarking, we found that the majority of our peer airports are currently offering valet services. And while we have frequent travelers who not only come through Sky Harbor on a regular basis, they also go through our peer airports. So we really want to make sure that we can offer them the services they expect from America's friendliest airport. Today I have Roxanne Favors here, Deputy Director over Business and Properties, and she's going to present the business terms for our proposed pilot ballet program. But before I turn it over to Ms. Favors, I wanted to talk about the parking program and its new home in Business and Properties. As of May 1st, just this year, less a month ago, yes. um, business uh, parking was reassigned from operations to business and properties. And we're continually looking for ways to improve our operations, and this trans transition was just one of the efficiencies that we've implemented. Parking is one of the largest non-aeronautical revenue producers for the airport, so it was just a natural fit to relocate it to the business office. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Favors. Thank you. So just to give a little recap of our parking program for calendar year 2014, I know oftentimes we talk in fiscal years, but I find it easier to talk in calendar years. Most people understand that. Um, for the last calendar year, we have about 24,000 parking spaces. We did about $2.8 million, um, million transactions last year that grossed us a little over $80 million. And our average daily parking rate for our garages is $25 a day. So um, as Acting Assistant Director um, Larkin explained, we do look at our peer airports. So what our staff has done over the past year is that we did some benchmarking to see what are our peer airports are doing, are they doing the valet services, what is their rate that they're charging for the valet services, and then what is their airport parking rate. And as you can see, eight out of our 11 airports offer the service, and it's a mix. So some have garage services, some have curbsides, some have both garage and and curbside. And I, I do want to point out, um, in finding all airports, you often hear us say, when you see one airport, you see one airport. This really applies to valet services. There are other factors that led them to create or start their valet services. I'll use Charlotte as an example. Charlotte Airport implemented valet services because they tore down the garages that were adjacent to their terminals. They were outdated and they needed to rebuild them. So they needed to offset that with valet services. And most of our industry peers do this, the industry standard, as a management fee uh, setup for these services. But we wanted to know about um, from the operators, from their perspective of being able to provide these services. So just to let you know who we met with, and this is what the staff met with prior to us going to our business and development subcommittee. We met with Ace Parking, um, the valet, the airport valet, uh, global parking systems out of Indianapolis, standard parking, as well as American Valet. And we wanted to hear about from them the opportunity and what they thought about the opportunity at Sky Harbor. So we did get some great feedback back from them and they kind of lumped into three big categories really it was customer service expectations and they really wanted to know from the airport what's our expected wait time um, for the customer and where those drop off and pick up locations we're going to be at um, likewise under pro um, processes for revenue control we know that meeting with them that we need to collaborate on like revenue control and ticket management, the details and the logistics of how to be able to provide the service. And of course, they're always worried about profitability. Labor costs are really intense on this type of service for the number of shuttle drivers, a number of valet runners, and it all depends upon the drop off and pickup locations. So kind of based upon all that information, we are recommending a pilot program. And truly our goals are about that it's clean, it's safe, and it's on time, but you're providing that professional, friendly um, service that is 
expected at America's Friendliest Airport. And why we want to recommend a pilot program is because we've never offered this service, and so we want the industry, as they are the experts, to tell us how best they think they can deliver the service here at Sky Harbor. But we do want to put some minimum qualifications uh, on that service operation. So we're asking that they have five years, uh, at least five years experience in providing valet parking services at a venue that has a minimum of 80,000 transactions per year. And in meeting with the five companies, they've all said that they can meet that requirement. Additionally, because we know that the on-site general manager is so important, we wanted to make sure that they had five years experience out of the last 15 as an on-site general manager, being in charge of managing the operations, scheduling, and ensuring that it is a safe and clean operations. So we're recommending a pilot program that we will pick the best qualified respondent to, as our operator. We're looking for a pilot program of two years with two one-year renewal options that are at our discretion at the airport. That we wanted to ensure that the current average daily parking rate is paid to the city. So we want to make sure that they're not cannibalizing any activity that would have normally gone into the garage. Um, additionally, we're letting the valet operator keep their valet fees. So whatever that valet service rate is, they get to keep that portion. They just need to ensure that we get the average daily parking rate. Um, and also we want to make sure that the valet rate isn't lower than the posted daily parking rate. You may have seen on the uh, peer assessment that there are some airports that the valet rate is a little lower than their average daily, but that's because the airport set the valet rate and it's a management fee, so it's all passed through. Um, and lastly, we want to make sure there's no operating costs to the airport. So the operator is on all the expense to start up their operations and run that smoothly. We feel a two-year program allows us the opportunity to see how does it work, maybe make some corrections, and then be able to come back and have a longer solicitation for these services. For our criteria that we wanted to ensure, of course, the qualifications and experience of the company. We also want to make sure that the qualification and experience of the general manager is also evaluated as there are on-site eyes and ears for the program. But we want to then have the operators give us their approach to the business opportunity. We want them to tell us where's the best locations to provide this service, how they would do that, whether it's garage or terminal, um, how many locations that will be, because really have them take a look at our airport to see where it best works. And lastly, we also want to make sure that there's a marketing program of how they're going to promote and encourage customers to use the service, as well as a customer service plan. We want to make sure that they are staying professional, that it is uh, on time and a great service that's provided. Provided. So based upon uh, these business terms, we are requesting your recommendation to the City Council on approval of the business terms for valet parking services. I do like to note that this solicitation is currently under the solicitation transparency policy. So for all interested parties that wanted to meet with us going forward from May the 7th, we do post that as a public meeting notice. Okay. Great. Uh, we don't have cards on this. I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Do we have anything? Councilwoman Diego? Uh, yes, yeah, no. Um, did we, as we developed this talk with the business travelers about sort of how much they value time versus price and some of those trade offs so we can have information as we decide garage versus? Um, drop off right in front of the terminal and some of those logistics. Certainly, um, Vice Mayor, Councilman Gallego. We haven't pulled together like a surveying of customers, but it's one of the number one comments that we do get mm -hmm. from the parking program is regarding valet services. Mm -hmm. So hopefully through the pilot, we're able to kind of establish those and be able to also um, adjust those with the customer's expectations. And as people who attend this subcommittee regularly know, sometimes with downtown parking, we have multiple stakeholders, and sometimes they have different goals for geography. So uh, we have our incumbent parking operator, Ace. Are they here today? OK. As a Which, fact, would, uh, <laughs> Councilman Gallego, uh -huh. we do have a representative from Ace Parking here today. It would just be wonderful for me, I think, if they might be in the garage, if you could speak to sort of what that would mean for you, or if, if Ace or someone could, um, are there concerns the, we should think about ahead of time? About how the um, multiple programs will work together. Right. So we do have a, a extensive, we have a single parking operator that operates all the parking at Sky Harbor. And this valet program will need to coexist um, 
our current parking operator will not be prohibited from um, pursuing this opportunity and I would imagine will be a very competitive proposer in this emissions. opportunity. But we do have interest from as many as five uh, proposers who are very interested in competing for this opportunity. So we will need to um, manage uh, potentially multiple operators working side by side in the airport environment. Um, which we do pretty regularly with concession operators and airlines and ground transportation providers. Um, but we will, as the uh, two-year period takes place, we will learn a lot more about how the valet uh, services fit into the overall uh, business environment and operating environment of Sky Harbor and then make recommendations moving forward about whether or not that needs to be uh, incorporated into the parking uh, management contract so that we just have one contract for all operations or whether there are reasons why uh, it should remain separate. Early on in my council career, we had robust discussions with taxi versus limo operators about geography. And so I just feel like while we're early in this process, if anyone has concerns, now would be a great time to, to talk about that while we're designing the program. So if you don't have concerns, that is great. But I, I just think that early on, we ought to talk about if we have people who are potentially competing, what what that means and how do we address that. But if we don't have concerns. I, I would just add that we can reach out to Dallas-Fort Worth. They are uh, an airport that does have valet services and they have up to three different operators providing valet amongst their terminals, terminal garages, so we can get lessons learned from the airport on what their experience has been to ensure that everyone plays nicely and that we have those uh, customers that don't want to use valet, that there are still uh, parking stalls available to them in the garage. Wonderful. Um, by Vice Mayor, Councilwoman Gallego, uh, one, of, one of the distinctions between ground transportation, per se, and parking is the, um, the contract for terminal garage and, for that matter, economy garage parking is a management contract to the benefit of the airport. Uh, which is separate and apart from a business model associated with encouraging people to participate. Uh, so ACE makes uh, a management fee and pays the expenses of operating the program, but they don't get uh, compensation if more people park or, or they reduce their revenues unless there's a demand reason that we need less staffing. So, they're, they're, so the, the business models are materially uh, different, I think. But I think your point is well taken, and as the airport evaluates is there the opportunity for different operators at different locations? We will, we will learn that, I believe, in the process that could inform in the future. And your experiences with other ground transportation providers, I think, would extend to this where you start to create an environment where there are multiples. So I think, um, I, I think the airport staffs, um, I think, understands and agrees uh, those are concerns to watch. But I think as to the regular parking operation, I don't think there's the likelihood for a lot of competitive conflict. Wonderful. And I think also just being on downtown as the committee's jurisdiction there, where we you can now have three different apps to park in downtown Phoenix. And it is sometimes confusing to our downtown parkers as to how many different things the city is doing. And so I think now is the time when we're talking about program design just to look for potential synergies. and. Right, Vice Mayor Councilman Gallego, I think that's a great customer service comment. We should absolutely figure out how we make it simpler for the travelers. So I think that's wonderful, and that's something we'll definitely explore. Wonderful. And then as we move forward in this, we will sort of be agnostic to the solutions and just get, or we will, when we're decide, balancing time versus sort of safety and some of those concerns with the solutions that are proposed. Yes, uh, Vice Mayor Valenzuela, Councilwoman Gallego. We have set this procurement up so that the uh, experts in valet parking can uh, give us good insight as to what is, is the proposed solution based on their expertise. And we can study that and learn more about it at Sky Harbor. So rather than designate a specific program and then competitively bid based on financial return, among other things, We've set this up to give ourselves the flexibility to incorporate. Um, it is a very different environment than a restaurant or hotel type of valet parking operation in terms of where you do it, what is perceived as being convenient in, in the customer's mind, um, and then the timing. We, we know um, 
well in advance when the customer will be arriving at the curb to get their car. And so there's some opportunities to do things differently at the airport and, and we're looking forward to seeing uh, recommended approaches uh, proposed by the field of uh, operators out there uh, so that we can learn how this would work best at Sky Harbor. Wonderful. Well, I would love it if the, the selection panel could include someone with expertise in security, but also a business travel, perhaps a business traveler just to understand. I think sometimes there are things with how people submit reimbursements or different things and how much we value uh, driving right up to the gate versus being in the garage that I think would be good to have that expertise as we move forward. Excellent suggestion. Thank you. Councilman? Following up on that, Tammy, you said two years at, with possible additional two years, correct? Mm -hmm. And how, how are you going to measure um, whether it's successful or not those first two years? Are you going to take what they submit to you on the RFP and have it specific enough that there's accountability and a measurement? Well, I would suggest um, a couple of ways we normally manage performance under uh, a service provider contract at the airport. Number one, customer service. We would be getting feedback from our customers and watching the performance of the operator to make sure that they're delivering the service safely and convenient for the customer and that the timing is working. Um, also, uh, watching the revenue performance of the service to see if if there is demand for it, sufficient demand for it, and if it enhances the parking program um, financially or not, would be a couple of measures that I would envision um, we would be watching for. Um, it's a very dynamic environment with a lot of moving parts, and so we want to make sure that this new service works with other operations um, that are happening at the airport, not only parking operations, but ground search transportation, shuttles, um, and that it is something that is well received by our customers, I think would be the most important criteria, that there's demand for it and that it's being delivered um, in a professional, um, high quality way to the traveling public at Sky Harbor. Do you have a, um, an area that you're, you think you will probably section off that would be just designated to, to the valet parking? And I, I guess um, you would be able to notice whether it's full or not at all times and whether you're losing revenue, correct? Right. That's why we want to give ourselves the flexibility to, to create the program um, without having it so specific at the time of proposal that if we changed it later, we would be subject to a bid protest. Um, we will have a designated area. We have not specified where that area could be. It could be um, a, a curb operation with a more remote parking. It could be something that happens within the garage at a very convenient location near the elevator lobbies. It could even be something that could work at the uh, East Economy parking lot with a convenient SkyTrain ride into the terminal. We're really looking for the expertise of the valet operators to study the environment and make a proposal um, with their recommended best approach to deliver these services at Sky Harbor based on their experience um, in other airport environments. I, I'm very supportive of the efforts. I'm just curious to see um, how you're gonna proceed, so. I'm interested to see that as well, Councilwoman. <laughs> this will be uh, an opportunity to learn about how these things uh, work in the environment. It's a very different environment, but uh, fortunately, uh, several other major airports have already uh, taken that step, and we can learn from their experience as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Gates. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would agree with the comments of my colleagues. I'm very pleased to see that we're we're moving in this direction, and found your uh, answer interesting on the different locations that you were looking at. And I wonder if you also might consider 44th Street in Washington as well, because there's uh, a variety of things that we're looking at, but I would think another uh, driver might be um, limiting the number of cars that are that are uh, going to the airport proper. Mm -hmm. And I could see valet there at 44th Street in Washington being 
uh, a, a really nice service. And again, I'll put another plug in that, that I think we um, politely think that we could do a better job of letting people in the community know about 44th Street in Washington, encouraging them to drop off folks there and pick up people there and to avoid you know, some of the traffic um, uh, at, at the, the airport itself. So hopefully that would be another place that we would, we would look at. Um, we like pilots. And I'm not talking about airline pilots now, although I'm sure we do. We like them too. Um, but we like pilot. We like pilot <laughs> programs uh, in the uh, in the city of Phoenix, and so I'm fine with that. But at two year, we're talking about two years, and then two one-year extensions. That seems kind of long for a pilot to me. Um, so I'd like to. Uh, hear what the thinking was to have a pilot that long and whether there would be some flexibility. It seems like to me after a year, we should have a pretty good handle on how this is working, whether it's working or not. Um, Vice Mayor uh, and uh, Councilman Gates, when we looked at the two years, we thought that, that was an, enough of a time that we could get actually good trend information, good data information, and then let us uh, get the opportunity to put together another solicitation for a longer period of time. Most airports have their um, valet services under a management fee structure that's often three years with two one-year renewal options so they're exposing it to the marketplace about every five years we felt that the renewal options allowed us times to put together the solicitation to do the outreach and get it issued and another operator in place so that we could do a smoother transition um, Vice Mayor Councilman Gates we also wanted to be sure that the initial opportunity is attractive to the field of proposers that it's a long enough term that it would motivate to um, for start up the operation and test the market as an operator so part of this is is attracting the competition uh, for the opportunity at Sky Harbor um, we also would be giving ourselves the flexibility to coordinate this contract with a future parking operator contract to uh, Councilwoman Gallego's point, if we wanted to combine those and have it all under one contract, uh, we would have the opportunity to coordinate that here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. a motion. Okay, we have a, entertain a motion? I, I would move staff's recommendation out for an approval to the council. Second. A motion and a second. I will just say that I'm uh, absolutely supportive of this. I I commend you for the the thorough research, and I I really appreciate the entrepreneurial spirit that the city of Phoenix is putting forth here, uh, because there is a need, and based on that need, and, and coming up with something like this to try to figure out how we can best fill it. That's what our city is all about. That's what that whole this whole entrepreneurial ecosystem is all about. And, uh, and this is an example of that, so it's really, really great to see. So we have a motion and a second. Further discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously, thank you. Moving on to our um, final item. We have item seven, adoption of an entertainment district in downtown Phoenix. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the subcommittee, Steph is here today uh, to talk with you uh, really about how downtown is becoming a neighborhood in all of the various aspects of what we would think about neighborhoods. And each where we each live, we have uh, school districts, uh, we have churches and other houses of worship, uh, and um, we have neighborhoods and eating establishments and all manner and kinds of businesses. And I think it is gratifying to see that downtown is progressing um, in that direction, uh, particularly in the inclusion of houses of worship and school districts. The interesting thing, though, is in a dense urban area uh, like downtown, uh, cheek to jowl uh, activity for uh, the things that have uh, long been good parts of downtown, which is the entertainment, uh, the uh, activities of the arenas, and all of the event activity um, and being next to churches and houses of worship often have some uh, conflicts that arise out of uh, the liquor licensing process. And so state law provides a mechanism for how to manage through some of those com uh, complex uh, relationships. And staff's here today to talk about uh, a recommendation we have that we believe has community support 
that provides a mechanism that still can allow us to manage those relationships in a uh, safe uh, and equitable fashion. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Christine Mackey and her team to share with you our recommendation about um, Entertainment District in downtown. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman and Council Members. We are here today to talk to you and, and for your consideration, uh, the creation of an entertainment district here in downtown. As Mr. Blue so um, appropriately put, well, churches and schools and neighborhoods and entertainment are tremendous fabrics of a community and they exist and they collaborate very, very well together. In the mid 2000s, there was a court ruling that said cities could no longer govern by zoning where churches or schools went. So you'll recall when we were all children, churches and schools were right in our neighborhoods. We walked out our front door and we walked to mass or we walked to school. Fast forward to today's economy and churches and schools go into multiple locations. They go into industrial buildings and they go into retail centers and they go into office buildings. And again, they're wonderful parts of a fabric of creating a community. Where they cause challenges are things um, like industrial users that can't have chemicals next to those type of users and the issuance of liquor licenses in certain areas. So in 2010, the state legislature created a statute called the Entertainment District, kind of a poorly named uh, legislation, but it allows for city councils to govern their own convenience of commerce and consider a liquor license within a certain distance of a church or a school. So with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Anna Darian, and give, have her give you a presentation on uh, what we'd like you to consider today. Anna? Thank you for that, and good morning, uh, Chairman, members of the subcommittee. So um, they did a fantastic job of laying it out, so I think we're pretty much good, but I'll get into some of the more drier topics, which is the logistics. Um, so just a little quick background, uh, the actual liquor licenses that are restricted are on the PowerPoint here. So the ones to the left, so bars, liquor stores, one the businesses where their primary function is liquor are the ones that are restricted within 300 feet. Um, however, things like restaurants and hotels, um, special events, those are permitted currently um, in downtown or elsewhere. So that's what we're looking at. Uh, as it relates to downtown specifically, we sort of did a little mapping of, this is the downtown code area, and then the little stars are areas where we have, I'm gonna call them conflicts, but basically areas where there's either an existing building or a uh, proposed business that was by a, a church and could potentially not locate because of that. We had some microbreweries come through and couldn't locate in their desired buildings um, do that. So kind of mapping that out throughout downtown. Um, a little bit more boring uh, logistics on the entertainment district. What, uh, it, how it works is basically it's an exemption process. This is not by right. Uh, city council would have the opportunity to hear an exemption to this 300 feet separation, and that would be a precursor to the liquor application. So the public process would remain. The liquor application would still come in. If um, a use permit is required, that would still go through zoning. None of that changes. This is not a zoning overlay. If something's permitted today, it's gonna be permitted tomorrow. Nothing changed on that level. These are heard case by case, so it's not a blanket um, cover to where if you're in the district, you're allowed to have that exemption, that would still be heard. And um, a, the city the size of Phoenix is allowed up to three districts, and they can be no more than one square mile. Um, so with that, the proposed district is this lovely uh, shape. Uh, basically the line in yellow here is the redevelopment area that we're familiar with. The orange is the proposed district, and we've got a little mapping out of the blue is existing churches, red are schools, and the little gray bubble is the 300 feet um, that we're looking at as far as this exemption. Um, the total area right now is about 0.92 square miles, so we're just under that one mile. Um, looking at the district, we worked very closely with the Downtown Phoenix uh, Inc. to kind of see what makes sense, both, like I said, with existing businesses, proposed growth, things we know about, things we didn't know about, uh, feedback we got from the community, uh, concerns we got from the community. We really um, kind of worked through this quite a bit. We've got nine churches within the district right now, no schools, and um, like I said, we just wanted to be really restrictive. This is not a district that would have signs it's not like the Legends Entertainment District. This is just really more of a, a tool, um, if you will, but we need to call it Entertainment District. So just a reminder, we can have up to three. So there's other proposals we got, maybe Midtown or Grand Avenue or 32nd Street or um, just a lot of great things happening in Phoenix, and that's a good thing. This is not limited to the central city like some of the tools that we have to kind of keep focused here. So. Um, Basically, here's the list of the churches. We got nine churches. We met personally uh, between myself and DPI or in tandem. We met with every single church. Everybody was 
you know, able to give feedback, what, understood what it was, what it wasn't. Um, we've got some representatives here today, and they can speak to that as well. But um, it's just, you know, a lot of questions, but overwhelmingly, definitely some support to move this forward. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today. Um, right here is all the neighborhood groups that we reached out to. So first of all, we didn't do a mailing to everybody within the districts. So we had four, over 400 letters that went out to everybody. And um, those letters listed the neighborhood meetings that we'd be in attendance at, the city council meetings where we'd be presenting it, as well as my contact information. And again, we had a lot of questions. Chairman. Sure, Chairman and council members, I think an important thing to note is by the legislative ruling, we didn't need to do that outreach. We could simply bring this to council for their consideration. We didn't want anyone to be caught off guard. We wanted to be fully transparent and make sure the neighborhood knew everything going on. So attending those nine or 10 neighborhood meetings and doing the mailers to every property owner within that um, entertainment district, we just wanted to make sure that everyone knew what it was and what it wasn't, and they had the opportunity to register any concerns that they would have uh, before we even proceeded through this process. Um, so yeah, so w we went to these eight neighborhood meetings, um, went <clears throat> anywhere where there's an active association, we reached out to them, and um, so the, you know everybody's aware of the proposal. Some of the concerns we did have, are addressed here in this next piece. I'll touch on this briefly because this is a process that will come before council again. But um, so quickly, there was a, a concern about liquor stores, particularly in downtown. Um, so that was something that we wanted to address within this. And so within that 300 feet separation, we are proposing to continue to have liquor stores um, restricted. Um, so that's something that was very beneficial and important to the community, and we wanted to put that out there. And then also, um, this is more internally, but we wanted to make sure that any bar that was coming through had a use permit um, process. There are parts of the downtown code that allow for bars by right, so that means they would never come before a zoning hearing. They would never have police have a chance to put any stipulations on that business. So within those 300 feet, um, if it's permitted by code, we are asking that those come in for a use permit process. Um, but that will be coming through through planning. So until that is worked out, uh, CED will be the keeper of this and will be processing um, the applications and helping customers through that. So yep, so that's about it. Um, with your approval, we'd like to move this over to formal on June 17th and, um, and start helping out. Thank you, it's very exciting. We have several cards. It's okay, we'll get to the cards here. Uh, I'll start with the cards that are in favor but I uh, do not wish to speak. Mr. Pat could tell me. Welcome. It's good seeing you. Uh, Brett Wingate and Sherry Rampy. Thank you. It's good seeing you. Okay. Uh, Herb Eli. Yes, sir. Would you like to speak? Yes. Come on up. Welcome. Mr. Eli is marked in favor. Uh, right over to the microphone where we can capture you on television. Uh, I'm here representing the Nash. The Nash is a jazz venue and performance center for the, the teaching of jazz in at 110 East Roosevelt and indispensable to a jazz club is the sale of alcoholic beverages. And what happened is, and many of you may know this, that we were quite happy with the BYOB, the Bring Your Own Bottle. And the state approved that. But the state made a mistake. And they acknowledged their mistake. Because we, after the fact, and we were in business for a while, as, and with, without any problems from any source, from anyone, the state said, well, you're really not an association. And without getting into the technicalities, it was true. So the state made a mistake. And because they understood that they made a mistake, they gave us additional time to try to come up with the exception and the exemption that would be, that, that would be done under the entertainment district plan. And so the state has been very cooperative with us in that, in that connection. And during the time that we've had the BYOB, we haven't had a hint of a problem. So 
uh, and if this is approved and we eventually get it, then we, we will be able to serve, and we're only interested, frankly, in, in, in selling beer and wine. And the church that is near us is very, the Roosevelt Church, is very cooperative with us and very understanding. And in fact, uh, part of what we do there, the son of the minister is very much involved in, in taking some lessons there. I have attended a number of the meetings that Anna had talked about, and, and uh, they were all favorable. They were all favorable. So it is indispensable to our operation that we have this, and I seek your approval. Thank you. Sir, thank you for being here. Billy Shields, Mr. Shields. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members, uh, Billy Shields, 11 West Jefferson. Um, uh, wear a couple of hats. Um, I'm the, I'm the co-chair of the uh, Phoenix Community Alliance Central City Planning and um, Development Committee. I'm also part of the Warehouse District Board that Councilwoman Gallego got together about a year ago. And I'm an investor in uh, Lure City Center and an escrow in another building that will be affected by uh, this provision. Um, uh, like our staff, I think, is often, they're, they're being very proactive uh, looking at this. this, this um, vibrancy that's downtown and is now exploding. Uh, they're just trying to facilitate it. And I think uh, they've gone the extra mile in all the outreach they've done to the houses of worship, uh, Phoenix Elementary, and, and those that might be affected and might consider it a negative thing. Um, and so I just say uh, my hat's off to everyone. I obviously support it from different points of view. And um, I think it pre presents some um, potentially business crushing situations from happening and I'll say, speak from the warehouse district point of view the, a church just bought a warehouse um, across the street from the deuce that we've all um, come to love uh, the deuce has a 12 license which today is not a problem on distance um, if the bar is sold or if they can't meet the food requirement of a restaurant license they have to go get a six uh, potentially have to close the doors of, of a business that has held on through the downturn and, and become uh, a significant part of downtown. So, so in doing this, I think you're anticipating those situations and, and I really want to express uh, support for it and thanks to staff for the hard work. Thank you, Billy. Uh, Brian Albu, did I get that right, sir? Yes, sir. Thank you, great. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm here uh, as a board member of the Nash as well, and I won't cover that same ground again, but um, it, it's a nonprofit organization. I think it, we're dedicated to the, enhancing the culture of downtown. I'm also very involved in Phoenix Community Alliance and on that board as well. Uh, I'd just like to thank the movement of this, how, how quickly it happened and how it has come together, and I think I strongly support it and thank you all for your effort. Great. Thank you, sir. Dan Clocky, Downtown Phoenix, Inc. Thank you, Chairman Valenzuela and members of the subcommittee. Dan Clocky with Downtown Phoenix, Inc. Uh, I, too, just want to add my voice uh, to, to the chorus here. Uh, I've had the privilege of working with Ms. Mackey, Ms. Darian on this project. We have done a lot of traveling around the neighborhood, a lot of outreach, as has been mentioned, um, speaking to neighborhoods, quite honestly, that were outside of the boundaries of this. We really wanted to be aggressive in our outreach so that folks understood what this proposal was. Um, and so in, in all that outreach with the communities, with the different pastors of the, of the, the various churches, we have not heard uh, concerns. Um, people have been very supportive of it, asked good questions. We've been able to answer those questions. Um, just one last note. Um, in the last five years, I've personally taken around three microbreweries. It's downtown. They've all looked at some of the same buildings, and they couldn't go there because it was within the proximity of 300 feet to a church. This is actually, in a strange way, an adaptive reuse tool because it's gonna allow us to use some of these buildings that we haven't been able to use. They've been sitting and literally rotting for years. So I'd appreciate your support and thanks again to CED and this partnership. Thank you. Uh, David Calverly. This is our, our last speaker for this item. Uh, Vice Mayor, Council Members, uh, I'd like to present to you some real-world examples of how this entertainment district uh, expansion would work uh, from my own experience. Uh, my wife and I own Bentley Projects uh, in the Warehouse District on Grant Street. We have an event business 
um, where we rent the building to weddings, corporate events, a variety of uh, entertainment type uh, uses. We have applied for uh, a class six bar license. In fact, I think that package is probably just coming to council um, in the next couple of weeks. When we applied, we realized that we were 292 feet away from the church on First Street. As a result, we had to take a portion of our property, 20 feet of it, and excise that from the liquor license application. It hasn't created a specific problem because we didn't use that particular building for the venues uh, for the events. But it's an example of what can happen when you apply for a class six license. The second example I want to give to you is last year, we rented Bentley projects on Sundays to Mars Hill Church. They held services every Sunday from seven o'clock until two o'clock in the afternoon. That tenant left in January, but if they had still been there, we would not have been able to apply for a class six license because of the existence of that church in the very same building where we hold weddings and corporate events. With the entertainment district, the council now has the ability to look at very specific examples and make a determination on a case-by-case -case basis that they will allow that kind of supposedly incompatible activity. Mm -hmm. So those are just two real world examples of how this expansion will aid and benefit, but still allow the council control. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for making those, those points. Those are some of the reasons I'm supportive. Okay, so uh, those, that's it for the cards. I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Any questions or comments? Councilwoman Williams? Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor, I, I'm very supportive of this. I think uh, I applaud your efforts going beyond what you had to do t to gain extra support. Uh, as we grow, uh, it is important that we look at the <coughs> details that prohibit further growth in some areas that we really want to, to occur. So I'm very supportive of this, and I would move approval. We have a motion. Second. Second. I also discussion. appreciate the yeah. outreach and have been glad to see you around the district. Uh, you've district eight staff uh, says that you've you've done, really done the full tour, and so thank you for doing this the right way and really engaging folks. I think once it's explained, people understand why it makes sense for our downtown and for our long-term vision of a even more vibrant, even more dense downtown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I support this as well. At the same time, I also thank you for including the use permit requirement. I think that's important uh, to have that in there uh, for the, the residents who would like to weigh in on this. But uh, it's, it, it makes sense. And, uh, and uh, certainly, uh, it's a, so this would be the first one then in the city of Phoenix. So I think uh, you, know, there, you mentioned a few of the other places where this might make sense as, as well to go up to the three that, that we are allowed under state law, so thank you. I'm supportive. I think this is going to add to our vibrancy here. I think everyone agrees. Uh, I, I really appreciate the effort that, that's been made uh, in the community. I agree, you, you did it the right way. You're doing it the right way. And um, and I also appreciate that, that this continues to protect the liquor license public process. Mm -hmm which is incredibly important, which I know our neighborhood leaders, our community leaders truly care about. Uh, this is this is going to be great. I, I, it's going to be fun to watch, uh, again, the vibrancy continue uh, downtown, and I think this is going to have something to do with that. So we have a motion and a second. No further discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you so much. Uh, eight is uh, the final call to the public. There are no cards. We'll go on to item nine. Everyone has a, a list of future agenda items. Uh, are there any uh, items that we should consider? What, oh, September? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Mr. Chair, in October, could you uh, give us an update on uh, the sports activity that we're going to have right after the first of the year and the planning process that's going on and who all is involved? Great idea. Uh, we, we would be very <coughs> pleased to share with you uh, what we're doing and while not wanting to um, um, violate the open meeting law, I guess I would tell you that your experiences from Super Bowl Central in terms of how we organize ourselves is precisely how we are, we'll come back and tell you uh, we're doing the work uh, for champ game. BCS championship game. Good point. Count, thank you, Councilwoman. So we'll have that in October? Yeah, that, that, that's fine. We'll, we'll fit it to the agenda as it appropriately fits, uh, but certainly no later than October. Okay. Uh, any other items? Good. All right. Uh, Hearing no other items, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much.